study on Sunday morning, June the 6th at 10 a.m. You will not regret that. You will learn so much. It'll be a great thing. And see, you're already used to being here at 10 a.m. anyway. Amen? Amen? And so you can just roll right into that time and that Bible study hour and then come on down here at 11 o'clock uh, for our preaching service. Our, our uh, praise and worship team is so wonderful. The singing is just unbelievable. It's just so good. And I just thank God uh, for all of them and for all of you. Now, first things first, we have a, a well, we always have a celebrity in here, but Brother Butch Ross, uh, if you didn't see that they dedicated the gymnasium at West Lincoln High School uh, to the Forrest Butch Ross, call it gymnasium. And so I want to give him... And I know that, that they're all proud of him and all the years of service that went into um, to his life and for them to make that decision for all those years of service. But I'd like to thank him for other reasons. I'd like to thank him for being uh, our associate pastor and um, for being able to stand in the gap when your pastor can't be here. And so, as you, most of you know, that Tanya and I had COVID a couple, for a couple of weeks. And uh, so, Brother Butch, I say thank you. Thank you for standing in this pulpit and delivering the words that God lays on your heart to this congregation that he has charged us with to shepherd. And so, I thank him for that. So, now, before Mother's Day and before COVID, we were dealing, we had come out of, of Easter Sunday where we were dealing with the resurrection. I want to, I have another sermon that was involved in that series there that I want to bring to us this morning that I believe that we need to look at. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Acts, please. The book of Acts. <clears throat> well, I'm going to continue to drink a little bit of water as needed as my voice is still getting better. But it's not quite there yet. The book of Acts, now, to catch some of us up, quite a few weeks ago, the disciples experienced the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then after that, a couple weeks ago, Luke explained how his gospel was written to Theophilus to show proof of Jesus' ministry and that he was who he said that he was. And we understand that. Jesus Christ is who he says that he is, and we can see that in the Word of God. We also learned about the absolute necessity of the Holy Spirit as Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and wait on it. Now, they could at that point receive power that they would need in order to spread the gospel around the world. So Jesus gives them this, this order and says, go to Jerusalem and wait there to receive the Holy Spirit, the power that they would need in order to go out and spread this wonderful and great and mighty gospel that gives us all hope, that gives us all eternal life. And so they knew that they needed to do these things. And then the last time that we met in this series, we learned about Jesus' ascension into heaven. And we learned that when Jesus speaks, we need to listen. And we also learned that Jesus is coming back. Remember when he ascended and they looked and they said, what are you looking at? That what you see going is the same one that you will see return. Right? And so we learned about his ascension and we also realized that Jesus Christ is coming back. How many of you realize here this morning that Jesus is coming back? Amen. Amen. He is coming back. We don't know the date. We don't know the time. We get all these, these different things and prof prophetic things that kind of show us and, and get us ready. And that's what we're supposed to always be doing is being ready for his return as he'll return like a thief in the night. Amen. And so, but one thing we know for sure, he is coming back. Now this week, I want us to take a look at what, it se what seems to be the very first post-resurrection church service, and really mainly from this service, what we can learn from what these early disciples did. 
If you found your way to the book of Acts, please turn with me to chapter 1. Chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 12 through 14. We've worked our way from 1 all the way to these verses now. Chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. As you find your way there, if you would, please stand with me as we read God's holy, perfect, precious, and authoritative Word. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Now the Word of God says here, as I've already led up to exactly where we're at, the Word of God says, they, then returned they, and I'm reading out of King James, unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where they abode with Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brother. This is the Word of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you once again this morning. We want to thank you for those that you have brought out here to hear your word. But Lord God, more importantly, that you would continue to give us the strength and the courage that we need to go out into a lost and dying world to take the message in which we hear today to those who have no hope because they have not you. And Father, I Thank you for allowing me to be your man in the pulpit, Father. A great responsibility, Lord God, that cannot be done without the full force of you, Lord. So let it not be me that we focus on today, but let it be your sweet, sweet spirit, because that's what changes lives. And Father, we thank you, and in Jesus' name, amen and amen, and you may be seated. Now, <clears throat> the first thing I want us to see about the verses in which we just read is this. If you like to take notes, I definitely want you to write this down. I think that you'll be able to get a lot of that out of this as you look over some of these verses throughout the week and, and realize what the Word of God is trying to teach you and to tell you. The first thing is this. The church needs to be in obedience to the Word of God. Okay? The church corporately, right? That's all believers. Everyone who claims to be under the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. All those who have believed on Christ for their eternal salvation. That is what we consider the church. The church needs to be in obedience to the Word. So not just individually as we make up the church, but also corporately as we come together as a body of believers. Look with me at verse 12, if you would please, once again. The Word of God says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Now, what we need to understand here this morning, dear ones, is this was notable obedience. This was notable the Word of God does not make any mistakes. They noted this here in verse 12, that the disciples returned back to Jerusalem. Notable obedience. Jesus told them to return to Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we saw that in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, just a few prior sermons ago dealing in this series. So he says, hey, you go to Jerusalem and you wait there for the Holy Spirit that will give you power to take the gospel message out to a lost and dying world. And so we see here in verse 12 it says, what? Then they returned to Jerusalem. Notable obedience. And that is exactly what they did. Now, they might have gazed for just a few moments, as we saw in verse 11, as he ascended and the disciples gazed up, but they did not stand there for long. 
They didn't forget the sermon right after they heard it or go back to their houses and throw their Bibles up on the counter. They didn't say, I guess we will hear some more next Sunday. They did what Jesus told them to do even though he was no longer even physically present with them. They didn't say, okay, we'll, we'll sit out here until next week and then we'll hear some more. We'll continue to take in and take in and take in. No, the Word of God shows that these disciples had notable obedience. Notable obedience. They knew what they had to do. It wasn't about going home, throwing the Bible in the corner, picking it back up next week when it's time to come to church, but it was about obeying the Word of God in the moment. In the moment. So many things we could preach on just with that. Are we obeying the Word of God in the moment daily? When you're at work, when you're at school, when you're at play, are you being obedient to the Word of God? Are you doing what he tells you to do? Are you waiting and listening on that still small voice and then reacting upon it and doing what needs to be done? They did what Jesus told them to do, even though he was no longer even physically present with them. A couple of notable Old Testament verses come to mind in this, and you can make side notes so you can have them to read throughout the week, Exodus 19.5. Exodus 19.5 states this, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Jeremiah 7.23. But this is what I command them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in all the ways in which I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Exodus 23, 21. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, since my name is in him. These are Old Testament references dealing with obediency unto God. It's always been about obeying. It's always been about Christ. Christ didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And we have a job to do as a church, as individuals who make up the body of believers, the church as a corporate body. And that is to obey the Word of God. And I know it ain't always easy. It's not always a simple thing to do. God didn't say it'd be easy. But he told the disciples to go and wait on the power. And if you're a believer here this morning, you have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. The same power that raised Christ from the grave now resides within you. Amen. You have the power to say no. You have the power to start to train yourself, as Paul would tell us, to turn from certain things, not because it's easy, not even because it's made easy. It just means that we have the power inside of us. We have sinlessness living inside of us. And through sanctification, we want to start looking more and more like that new man. Dear ones, too many Christians today come to church on Sunday mornings. They hear God's word and God's voice through the preaching and the teaching of his word and never, ever, ever seem to apply it to their lives. We do. There is a major, and I've been studying this and researching this for quite some time, there is this major disconnect in the Western church between hearing the Word of God and applying the Word of God to your lives, right? We come in and we hear the Word of God, but are we applying it? 
Are we utilizing it? I'm glad that you're a believer. I'm glad that you've believed on Christ for your eternal salvation. But are you applying the principles and the Word of God to your daily life? Not just, well, I tried not to cuss nobody out today. Well, thank God for that. Or I tried not to, to smoke a bunch of crack today. Well, thank God for that, Brother Mike. Are we applying God's Word? Are we separating ourselves from sin? Are we starting to walk with those who live for the Lord and walk away from those who do not? Are we trying to live our lives in accordance with the Word of God? I think of all the packed, seeker-sensitive churches that we can see on any given Sunday that are out there focused more on entertaining than they are obedience. We see it. They practice eisegesis instead of exegesis. What can God do for me? What can God do for me? Like I'm the center of the universe. I put in. I put myself in instead of taking God's word out. And so many churches do that, especially these seeker-sensitive type churches. Everything revolves around the person. What can God do for me? By God, what are you doing for what he's already done for you? He gave you everlasting life for God's sake. What are we doing for him? Just going about our daily business, looking at these types of issues. The people leave these seeker-sensitive places on an emotional high feeling that they have really accomplished something, yet never learning how great it is to actually apply God's Word, hallelujah, to their daily lives. Man, they feel good. They feel pumped. You can go to any of these concerts. You feel pumped. You come out. You're on emotional high. Woo! You might even say a few of the things that the pastor or the preacher said or the speaker or the motivational speaker, whoever. You might throw a couple of them on your Facebook page. A couple little quips and snippets. But is it changing your life? Are you applying the Word of God to your life? That's the change that God is looking for. I thank God for your salvation. But what are you doing with it? Dear ones, if we are ever going to truly experience revival in the church, I want us to hear this. If we're ever going to truly experience revival in the church, or if we're ever truly going to experience revival in our own lives, the church needs to be in obedience with the Word of God. You want to see revival happen in your life? Obey the Word of God. You want to see revival break out in this body here at LFBC? Then individually obey the Word of God. Obey. Apply. Right? Get right. Whatever you want to call it. And come in excited to be in God's house, excited to praise Jesus' name, excited for what he has given you. Man, we can, we can walk around all day long and get caught up in our own lives. Don't get me wrong, I do the same thing many times. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you are a believer here this morning, God has given you the greatest gift of all. It's not about this life. We're just sojourners passing through this world. Our home is not here. It's in heaven. Well, we'll spend eternity. Too many people in the types of churches that I just listed a moment ago People want to feel that they've done something good and then live how they want to live the rest of the week. And you hear that from preachers all the time. But it's the truth. 
We want to do what we want to do. We want to live like we want to live. We want to continue on doing the things that whatever makes us feel good, whatever the case is, but we're in direct disobedience to the Word of God. It don't mean being born. It don't mean living a boring life. Oh, I'm going to obey God's word. I got to live this boring life. It's the greatest life ever. He gives you life. Contentment plus God in this equals great gain. Are you content with what God is giving you? Or are you trying to fill your life up with a bunch of worldly mess that will never make you happy? Secondly, write this down. It's good stuff, guys. Amen? Amen. The church needs to be in fellowship with one another. Right? The church needs to be in obedience to God's Word, and the church needs to be in fellowship with one another. Look with me again at verse 13. The Word of God says this, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode them Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon Zealots, Judas, the brother of James. Now here, what I want us to see specifically this morning is we see many of the disciples coming together. Listen to me. Many of the disciples coming together in one place, in one fellowship, in one accord, and under one blood-stained banner, and that is of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So they're coming together. They're fellowshipping together. Right? Which is what the Bible tells us we're supposed to do. Not forsaking the fellowship with one another. Right? We're to come together in one accord. One fellowship, that's what they did. Still under the obedience of God. Didn't even realize it maybe. He said, hey, all of y'all go wait there for the power that's going to come upon you. Post-resurrection service. They're coming together. They're in one accord. They're in one fellowship. The Word of God gives us the impression that as many as 120 of Jesus' disciples came in and out of that room over a 10-day period of time. So while they was waiting on the day of Pentecost for those 10 days, the Bible would give us the understanding that possibly even as many as 120 people came in and out. I can only imagine that they were packed in like sardines. Nobody wanting to leave. Everyone just wanting and waiting on the Holy Spirit to show up and show out in that place. Can you imagine? Jesus says, go, wait for the Holy Spirit there in Jerusalem where you will get power. So they start packing in, people coming and going, people coming and going. And they're waiting, man, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting on that power to show up and show out. Because they know from what they had already seen that Jesus is who he says he is. And so they were waiting, right? They're waiting on that power. That's what they're waiting for. I can only imagine what it would have been like and what it would be like. And I know that we're in the midst of a pandemic or hopefully coming out of it. But if we were all packed in like sardines, nobody wanting to leave to go to Bojangles, nobody wanting to leave to go to Zaxby's, Nobody checking their watches to see if the preacher's done yet, but everybody just waiting and watching for the Holy Spirit to show up and show out in a mighty way in this house. I just imagine, Brother Mike. We're all just packed in, man. Preachers preaching, ain't nobody checking their watch. Ain't nobody worried about what time it is. Everybody's sitting back saying, come on, come on, God. I'm ready. I'm ready to do this thing, waiting on the Holy Spirit to show up and show out in a mighty way. That's the kind of, that's the kind of corporate body. And that's the kind of individual faith that we need. Is that us here this morning? 
many times I wonder how many people show up to church on Sunday mornings and are already ready to leave before they get here, right? Many times we, we drag ourselves, many times somebody else drags us. And so I wonder how many people are ready to leave before they ever walk through the door. They're already shut down spiritually. They don't want to hear nothing. Maybe they're even mad that they got to be here. And so I wonder how many people are like that. I wonder how many so-called Christians are just checking off their weekly church box instead of truly desiring to fellowship with others in the congregation and with the Holy Spirit. Well, I'll come to church today and I'll check that box off. I know it's what I'm supposed to do. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all about habitual activity when it comes to God. It can, it can build, make you have a habit of coming to church, and I understand that. But at some point, your heart has to catch up with your habit. And so that's what I, I long for. That's what I desire, that everybody comes in here and we've got this attitude and this heart to worship God and to fellowship with other believers, with others of like mind, and to go out and take the gospel into a lost and dying world. That's what it's about. It's not about being perfect. It's about serving a perfect God. It's not about being perfect. It's about trying to align your life with the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not easy, but it's possible. That's why we have sanctification as a process. Nobody gets saved, and the next day they're a 50-year dedicated Christian. It takes time. It takes work. Not to get saved, but to be more and more sanctified daily. Are you putting in the work? Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm amongst them. Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together in the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Dear ones, I hope I hope to God you can see that the day is approaching. When we turn on the news, when we turn on the television, the things that we see, the things that we know good and well are in complete conflict with the Word of God going on in this world. I hope you see that the day is approaching. Dear ones, as we see this day of Jesus' returns drawing closer and closer, there should be a great sense of urgency that the church needs to be in fellowship with one another. Dear ones, this is what we have. This is what it is. We have to be in fellowship with one another. We have to come together and love one another because there is a world out there that wants to tear you to pieces. They want to pull you down. They want to drag you down. The devil wants to eat your lunch every day. And so we come together in corporate fellowship, not forsaking the assembly. And we lift each other up. We draw strength from one another. When you're down and I'm strong, you draw strength from me and vice versa. And we start to live this life with power. We start to live this life with victory. And we can only do that together as a corporate body of believers. Lastly, write this down. The church needs to be in prayer to God. We need to be in obedience to God. We need to be in fellowship with one another. And the church needs to be in prayer to God. Look last week, we went at verse 14. These all continued. Talk about all these disciples, all these people. With one accord in prayer and in supplication, 
with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now here the word supplication in the original language gives the impression of prayer with an earnest desperation. So prayer, as verse 14 would say, and supplication. So prayer and then an earnest prayer, earnest desire, a desperation, if you will, of prayer. The church needs to be in prayer to God. The church needs to be in desperate prayer to God. He is where we draw all of our strength. Without him, we are nothing. We are not a church at all. We're just a bunch of people gathered together in a kirche, a place used for religious events. But with the power of God and through the Holy Spirit living in the believer, we become the ecclesia, the church. That of God. The church needs to be in prayer to God. Desperation. Desperately seeking God's will for their lives through prayer. My God, is that what we're doing? Is that what we're doing? Are we desperately seeking God's will in our lives through prayer? Desperately. Prayer and supplication. Is there a desperation to your prayers daily? Oh God, oh God, help me to live better today. Help me to follow you better today. Help me to be a better Christian today. Show me the air of my ways. Give me the strength and power that I need in order to correct these things through the power of your Holy Spirit that dwells inside of me. Is that the prayer that we have? I know it seems like a lot, but it's needed. The desperate prayers. How many of us are desperately seeking God this morning in our lives? I'm telling you right now, people in this church are going, there's, there's people in this church going through what they would consider in their lives a living hell. Tanya and I have the, I, I, I consider it an honor and a privilege as the pastor and pastor's wife to hear about most of it, right? Are we desperately seeking God to change our lives? As a body of believers, are we coming together and desperately seeking God in prayer for the people in this church and for what they're going through? To come together, desperately seeking God. Who is doing that here this morning? For revival in your own heart and for revival in this church. To bring us closer to God. For most churchgoers on Sunday morning, prayer is something that they do over their food or possibly when they are worried about something. If I ask most Christians, how was your prayer life, they would respond by saying good or maybe I could do a little better. When in fact, they rarely set aside time each day to devote fully to prayer. Setting aside time to say, you know what? I'm going to the throne of God today at this time every day, not legalistically, but lovingly. I'm going to the throne of God today, every day at this time to pray for those who are hurting, to pray for my family, to desperately seek God for my church and for what's going on, to desperately seek God to change me so I can be the man or woman that God wants me to be. Is that the desperation of our prayers? We need to understand that if you're a Christian here this morning, there is power in prayer. Amen? There is power in prayer. I got a few little verses here. I want you to make a side note. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. 
Matthew 21, 22. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. John 14, 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may glorify, be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And I love that one because it gives you that contingency. If you ask anything in my name, you're going to come to the name of Jesus and ask for something. Your life or your prayer better be lined up with Jesus' desires for your life. Right? Lord, I want you to bless this unholy union I'm about to enter. Eh, ain't going to happen. It does not line up with God's will for your life. Lord, we're going to go out and get drunk tonight. And Father, I want you to keep us safe. Praise God, I hope he keeps you safe. But that prayer does not line up with what Jesus wants you for your life. In Jesus' name, whatever you ask in my name may be glorified, that I may be glorified. Mark 9, 29, and he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Talking about demons. Can only be driven out by prayer. Acts 9, 40. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, rise. And she opened up her eyes. And when he saw Peter, she sat up. Prayers can cast out demons. And oh, hallelujah. Prayers can raise the dead. Why? Because it's not because how we pray, it's who we pray to. Can I get an amen? amen? It's not about the power that's in us. It's about the power of the throne of God in which he has given all believers the right to come to and pray. Prayer. One British missionary by the name of Williams Carey says this, secret fervent, believing prayer lies at the root of all personal godliness. You want to get a stronger Christian life? Start by getting a stronger prayer life. You want to grow in Christ? Learn how to descend to your knees. Your prayer life is where you will grow as a Christian. The great missionary from the Holocaust, Corey Ten Boom. Don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. A man is most powerful on his knees. Amen. Man or woman is most powerful on their knees. <clears throat> Luke 11, 1, the disciples even asked Jesus to show them how to pray. And we've had a sermon series on prayer here. They asked how to pray. It was innate in them that they understood that prayer was going to be a key to having conversations with the Father through prayer. James 5, 16, the word states, the fervent prayers of a righteous person availeth much. You know that verse. Or my translation, a constant, constant prayers are the white hot prayers of a righteous person does much good. Those desperate prayers. Dear ones, the church needs to be in obedience to God. The church needs to be in fellowship with God. And the church most definitely needs to be in prayer to God. Amen? Please stand.